early identification of problematic gaming behavior, transforming the gaming industry. All right, so I'm Olga Yaroshevsky. You already met me today. Uh, I'm with the Sigma and ABC team, and I would like my dear panelists to introduce themselves real quick. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do and what is your background in the gaming industry. Jamie, let's start with Ladies you. first. Okay, ladies first. Hello there. I'm Jaguar Agal. I'm a lawyer and a CPA, but a nice person. And I deal mainly with the gaming and crypto and AI industry. And my focus is regulation, uh, companies in corporation, and um, using ethical points of view in order to comply with, uh, with regulation. And uh, naturally, uh, strategic uh, international taxation. But that's the business part. That's the money part. OK, Christina, thank you so much. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Christina Krisoforu. I'm head of the Safer Gambling and Business Development Unit at the National Betting Authority. The National Betting Authority is the regulatory body responsible for the licensing and supervision of all betting activity in Cyprus. And I uh, have worked there for the last six years, and uh, I've been working a lot with our Safer Gambling initiatives and implementing our uh, strategy. Thank you. Jamie? Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm the founder of the iGaming Academy. Uh, we started the business about seven years ago, primarily to help educate gaming operators and the industry at large uh, about core topics like responsible gambling, anti-money laundering, but also help um, upskill workforces and help build a, a solid workforce for the gaming industry. Today we train over 60,000 employees on a yearly basis across about 200 operators and B2Bs. Um, and our training is focused on about 40 different jurisdictions, US all the way to the sort of Eastern European markets as well. We have fantastic perspectives today from all parts of the industry. So um, I think, and I think Joanna gave us a fantastic heads up on how the industry works, especially here in Cyprus. So um, let's start from the basics. So how do we differentiate normal gaming behavior from problematic gaming behavior and how they can be accurately assessed? Who would like to take that one? So uh, I'm obviously a bit biased when it comes to education, but naturally education is really the, the foundation of um, instilling the right behavior and knowledge at a very early stage. Um, not only educating the, the general public, but also educating the companies that offer the services, because the truth is that it really needs to come from the operator and the B2B level, not only from the individuals and players that are um, utilizing the products. So, provided that there are the right checks in place, provided that there's the right support, um, then it really needs to be a, a sort of provider solution rather than mm. the general public. I could refer more to the personal point of view of the player uh, themselves, he, himself or herself, is the fact that, you know, when you uh, define fear as an anxiety, it means that it, fear might makes sense, but an anxiety is something that interrupts with your day-to-day -day life, normal life. So, playing to some extent should be fun. Betting to some extent gets up your adrenaline. It is a fun thing to do. And we, we live for, for fun to some extent. However, when that fun part element interferes with one's life, meaning um, you, spend on, uh, you spend more than reasonable amount of money or percentage of your income or your free income um, on that, or you spend uh, too many hours on that in which, in the sense that you need to work or you need to go to school and it interferes with your day-to-day -day life, then that's, a, that's an issue. For, just to give the contrary example, if one person was born highly rich, needing to do nothing, and psychologically balanced, and having nothing to do and is very bored. They have the money, they might have the, the time, so that doesn't really interfere with their life as long as they relate to other people's and, you know, relationships, etc. However, regular people, normal people, which do have either school or job, relationship, 
parenting or, or being uh, siblings and, um, and other things in life and sports and things to do physically, uh, when that becomes too much for them, that is a uh, definition when it is, that's hurting them. I think this would be the, the line. It's not a strict, like a black and white line, but um, the point is where it interferes with one, one's life. So it's more on a personal level. Yeah, yeah. Christina. Yeah, uh, I think this is what we call gambling-related harms. So we, you know, there's like a, an international terminology that it might differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So, for example, the UK GC uh, has a whole definition of the gambling-related harms, but it, it's not just on the person themselves. So if your spouse or your significant other or your family, your kids, they also suffer from this um, behavior of yours, then it, this is also affecting uh, society as a whole. So we're talking about the individual on the individual level and then the affected others. So we need to take that into account as well because it's not only um, on uh, a person's um, uh, behavior, but it's also financial harm to themselves and their kids. It's um, uh, lagging behind in school or uh, in their career. So yeah, you have a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, literature has a lot of signs of problematic behavior, but of course, as we go on and we, uh, we are approaching a, um, a public health uh, uh, lens for the safer gambling, uh, we see that it broadens, so it's not the responsibility of the individual, but it's also on what happens on the other uh, people in their lives. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a social issue, more of on a bigger scale. Speaking of which, when we try to implement systems that try to monitor and assess, right, that when this problematic behavior starts being problematic and becomes a social issue, what ethical aspects should we take into consideration? I guess there's again to you or... I think, well, it, it, it's very um, self-contradictive because any regular business the salesperson would be the highest achieving person to get the clients to buy and do and, 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 and purchase as much as possible. Look at Amazon, eBay, uh, AliExpress, or whatever. The point is to have you buy as much as you can, and, there probably there, and there's also shopping addicts as well. However, in the gaming industry and the gambling industry, it is, it is too sordid because on one hand, any business that wants to succeed wants to sell as much gaming time, hours, and fees, and, and revenues as possible. So that's capitalism on one hand. On the other hand, because of the cost of that, which is probably, I think shopping will go somewhere near that area as well. Um, because the cost would be regarding vulnerable societies and vulnerable people, um, they will kind of like destroy their life doing that, and they're the minority, but still then I think the society has adopted rules, ethical rules for itself to protect. And I think if we're looking at it from an a interest point of view, interest point of view, then the point of a society to avoid those heavy gambler, the ones who are hurting themselves and their society, what would be the point to do that? The only point would be to protect the, the reputation of that industry and to maintain only the ones who are doing this really for, for the fun of it, or professionals. Um, and I think the, the whole point is it, it's, it's too shorter because you want to uh, avoid that minority that actually gets you the most amount of money, most revenues. And um, I think because of that, because of that, because we can't um, count on companies, capitalist companies and people to monitor themselves, therefore regulation is a major part, even more than in any other regulated business, because we need guidelines from a government that protects the public uh, in order to set the limits of how much uh, to avoid business because of that society. This is the ethical, I, I took the ethical point of view more to the regulation one mm. because I believe that um, only regulation would be objective enough um, to set rules for everyone. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, so I guess the main role of a regulatory body is to provide the framework uh, for operators to operate, uh, uh, do their business. So we have, we, we have the opportunity 
to mandate some uh, responsible gambling practices policies. And uh, to that aspect, I think it's better for, for ourselves. I'm going to talk about the NBA. We have drafted uh, players protection uh, regulations, and we have provided in our regulations uh, that the operators need to have uh, specific objective criteria and parameters that can um, uh, risk profile, profile the uh, uh, players and categorize them according to their uh, risk profile and they need to have uh, specific uh, interactions intervention uh, according to the risk level and then uh, the operators operators need to prove the effectiveness of that interaction so it's not just okay we've done for example we saw that uh, a player has an irregular pattern of play and then we just had a chat with them. They need to prove that that intervention actually had an effect and an impact on the player and uh, um, it had a positive um, aspect in that uh, intervention. Thank you. Um, can we go back to um, the player experience? Jamie, do you think, are there any in-game elements or in-game mechanics that can be used to reduce the risk of, you know, appearance of that behavior? Yes, I think the short answer is yes. And depending on which market the operator is uh, active in, you would see more of those markers appear. Cool off periods, reminders, uh, limitation on bets. This is the kind of stuff that is quite apparent in some of the mature What is markets. the most commonly used mechanics for that? Uh, I mean, things like cool-off periods and reminders to losses, I mean, that tends to be quite a, a, an ongoing tool. I think the challenge is that rather than sort of those long-term recreational sort of gambling behaviors, it's really the new gamblers that, that concern me probably more than anything else. Because what you have right now is you have regulators who are enforcing um, certain due diligence in KYC but that usually comes at the very latest stage to, um, to the interaction with the player. So you mm. could have a player losing 1,000, 1,500 euros. Whether or not they can afford it doesn't matter. At, what, at a certain point, they are then sort of checked and, and, and assessed to whether or not they can you know, lose that kind of money and whether or not they should be gambling um, and they are legitimate gamblers and there's no sort of fraudulent activity. Mm. So the challenge is that it's very easy to gamble on sites in any market. Um, it's really at a point of when the losses become quite significant or when a withdrawal is requested, that's when the operators come into play. Before that, they're more than happy for you to deposit. I have a suggestion. Sure. Um, remember, you know, we, have, we see our advertisements for... Um, expensive alcohol brands all over, like in bus stops and everywhere, and whenever an alcohol brand wants to look um, responsible, it always says drink responsibly, right? On the bottom of it. It's obligatory in some countries. Yeah, of course. To put and that on the for ad, cigarettes as well. It says, you know, it kills well. you or something like that, right? But nobody really listens to that besides, I think, the, one of the effective things that you might see, if I may make the, the comparison, drunk people on the corners of streets, but usually they will not get drunk off a very expensive bottle of whiskey, right? They'll get uh, drunk on the cheaper ones or less expensive ones. So if gambling industry becomes a premium industry, a premium in which, in the sense that it will be much more expensive to get in, I mean, it's, it's against the capitalist uh, interest of, of, of uh, the industry, naturally, then people would be maybe more aware because I haven't seen people getting uh, you know, addicted to too expensive ones. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You should just raise the bar and then, yeah, yeah it but becomes... You'll make more revenues off of a game, but then you'll have a lot of less of a, of a market, naturally. But if you create it as a premium product, Mm. Um, I have a counter example that actually contradicts my point, but uh, probably... That reduces the audience, panel. though. Sorry, yeah. Drastically, yeah. Uh, oh, sure. I was just going to say that there's a fine balance. There's this uh, invisible line between creating too much friction for the players so that come into place with your suggestion. And uh, if you have, uh, like, a barrier to play, let's say, then 
they will move to illegal markets. So you have to, it will drive them to illegal markets where they are unprotected, where no regulations are in place. So we need to be uh, aware of that uh, fine balance between uh, over-regulation and making it like a premium and uh, not driving them to the illegal operators. And. Uh, Again, you know, I'm, I'm really on the side of the regulator and on the side of the operators, right? The operators are my clients at the end of the day. Um, and truly, we wouldn't really all be here unless there were operators doing well in the market. But I, again, I do feel that um, legislation and, and regulatory framework tends to be used as much as possible to the advantage of operators from within operators. And I think, you know, the, the point I was making before about having that due diligence done prior to withdrawal is an important one, right? The reality is that so much red tape is required once you make or you win a significant amount of money. The truth is the process to withdrawing funds, well, the, po the process to depositing funds is instant. The process to withdrawing funds, 24 hours, 48 hours, can keep going, right? And then documentation is required. I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, we work with clients in helping educate their, their employees on the processes that they have within the organization. I've seen some clients, you know, requesting six to 12 months of bank statements. Mm. They didn't request it when the deposit was made. They requested when the deposit was, when the, when the winnings were withdrawn. Withdrawn, yes. So, and that actually, you know, it may benefit the operator, but it also works against the market a little bit. It creates frustration and a lack of trust with the operator, mm. having them, you know, if somebody's gone in and put in 100 euros and they've won 1,000, you know, let them have them, you know, that moment in the day, right? Not put them through, you know, a week of back and forth just so you can hold their money in there. And more often than not, roughly about 60 to 70% of winnings are lost during that verification mm. period. That's no secret. That's the point. Yeah, that's the point. But I think this is called Responsible Gambling Board, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have a few minutes left. Um, so, which technology you think can be utilized? And maybe we can use AI, machine learning, right? Some emerging tech um, to develop some effective systems for this early identification of problematic behavior. Jaguar, I know it, that's your thing. <laughs> I deal with AI regulation, so um, um, that's my, my hobby. Well, AI being um, a machine, kind of like a technology that will not be able to explain how it got to a conclusion, but you train it on a zillion amounts of data, and then it finds uh, patterns and then deviations from patterns. And that's crucial uh, in an industry in which not all the irresponsible, the vulnerable gambles are the same, so you can't just set rules, specific rules of how to avoid or how to monitor and how to, to define them and recognize them. But we train AI over the so much amount of data that we have, patterns, hours, numbers, elements, uh, um, f you know, money per time, money per, per uh, act, et cetera, when we have those measures uh, already. Uh, if we train AI machines over that, we'll be able to find a lot of patterns which on one hand, can be used to encourage people to gamble more, which is okay for oh. 90 or whatever percent of the population of the gamblers who want to get more revenues. Um, but for those whatever 10 percent of the vulnerable uh, parts of uh, the society, we can see either deviations from normal patterns to see the patterns that would recognize the, the less vulnerable, the, the healthy um, gambler society, and to find the characteristics uh, of the vulnerable ones and then to limit them even more and not even being able to call it profiling or, or discrimination or anything. Um, so it has a lot of legal regulation and ethical limitations to what I mentioned, but uh, it would be a fantastic, amazing, efficient tool for that, in my opinion. Thank you, thank you. We unfortunately have only 30 seconds left. I would like Christina to wrap it up. So how do you think um, this you know, collaboration of technology, maybe mental health awareness specialists, regulators, and also uh, operators, right, and players, how this can benefit both the industry, the players, and the regulators. 
Well, I think the industry, the operators hold a, a vast amount of data. So they have a pool of data and they're sitting there. And I think uh, there should be uh, maybe a regulatory requirement that they need to collaborate with mental health professionals or academics in the field. And um, instead of academics having uh, their um, uh, research on laboratory uh, conditions, they would do it with real life data. And they're starting to do so. There are a lot of research out there. And we see that this can benefit also the players because the, the, the protection is enhanced and then also society because you don't have the social cost of gam uh, problem gambling and also operators because then it will drive a sustainable growth because no no one operator wants a problem gambler because they come they play and they leave that's it yeah. because they don't have like a, um, a stream of revenue that's uh, uh, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yep, our time is up, unfortunately. I had so many questions that I wanted to discuss with you. But thank you again for your insights. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamie DeBono, uh, Christina Christofori, and uh, Jaguar, thank Animal Gyaroshevsky. Please make sure to catch up with our fantastic speakers offstage. And we're about to uh, continue our program. Thank you.